So, so from this pyramid structure, we are talking about the idea of locality. And I discussed an example of a spatial locality, a temporal locality. If, if one data is being accessed, the chances of accessing the same data in time is more in the next iteration or next instant. There's another concept which we learned uh, in those lectures was spatial locality. That means if one block of memory is being accessed, it's highly likely that it's neighboring memory blocks are also going to be accessed. So if you are going all the way to the main memory, rather than fetching that, rather than simply fetching that block of memory, it is in your best interest to fetch some more neighboring blocks of memory and bring it to cache. And the focus of cache is to actually exploit these kind of localities. We will see different types of cache design and all these designs are in terms of storing these blocks of memory at a, at a point of time, okay? So example is like arrays, right? So if you're accessing one index of an array, it makes sense to grab the entire array and bring it to the cache so that you do not have to go all the way to the memory. Again, it's to do with the clock cycles. The closer it is to your CPU, the quicker your execution was going to be. Okay, so in, in terms of numbers, if you see this page, uh, Intel i7, uh, based on their spec sheet, your, their main memory is running 56 times slower than register. So you can see the gap in terms of access speeds, right? 56 times slower, that means if you're not storing something closer to your CPU or registers, you're going to suffer that much delay in terms of processing. So, so the idea here is to strike a balance between your CPU and between your main memory. And hence that kind of led us to this new memory, which we called as cache. The literal meaning of cache itself means to store temporarily or to buffer something, right? Caching. So that's the whole idea. So it copies the data from the main memory onto the cache in hope that it might be used again. Okay. Now, just like your virtual memory, there would be some interesting questions uh, that we need to answer. First of all, the question we are going to answer is what content, how do we decide like what content needs to be brought from main memory into cache? And if you're bringing, then how much you need to bring at one instant, like in one at, at a time, right? If you are going all the way to the main memory, how much you need to grab? So hopefully these questions help you in terms of understanding the idea of locality because we want to exploit locality to our advantage, we need to grab like chunks of data at a time. So recall in virtual memory, the unit of transfer was page. We were talking in terms of pages, which was typically four KB, right? So we're going to answer what is that smallest unit in terms of cache or what is that terminology called when we deal with cache memory? Okay. So hopefully the highlighted points here clarifies our dis this discussion so far. The idea here is the less the CPU has to go to the main memory to fetch or save data, the higher will be the performance due to reduced access time. Right. And then again, no surprises here it leads us to the temporal and spatial locality to be used, right? So we have already gone over this. And the, the reason here is that the locality is naturally present in our code structures, right? Because it's getting anyways executed sequentially until there's a branching or something, right? And if you have loops, all loops happen iteratively. So anywhere there's a loop in your code, 
like the example we took last time, right? Like if you have an array and you're stepping through an array to accumulate the sum of all the elements in the array, then your iterating variable and your accumulating sum exhibit temporal locality. If it's being used in iteration zero, highly likely it's going to be used in iteration one, two, and so forth. But your array, the array element that exhibits your spatial locality. If array zero is getting used, like the in index zero is getting used, then highly likely index one is also going to get used. So rather than just getting one element of array at a time, the first time obviously it will not be there in the cache. So the CPU sends a request that, okay, I need to add array zero to the sum. So it will look for it in the cache because cache happens to be closer to the CPU. If it's not in the cache, obviously it will not be in the cache if it's going for the first time. So what it does is there's a cache miss. If it does not find something in the cache, we call it as a cache miss. Then what happens is it has to go and search at the next level, which is your main memory. Now, if it is stored in the main memory, that is called as page hit. I'm trying to like bridge all these concepts now. So far we were talking in terms of main memory and virtual memory. So we were talking in terms of page hit or a page fork, right? So now it's the same thing with cache, cache hit or cache miss. So if you're grabbing your array zero for the first time, it's not going to be there in the cache. So it's a cache miss. That means go to the next level of memory, which is uh, main memory or RAM. If it is there, it's a page hit. So you get that record from the main memory, copy it into your cache, and then from cache, you take that data and make it work in your ALU, right? So, so that next time, if it has to go and access the same variable, it would be a cache hit. So your variables, which is your iterating variable I and your accumulating variable, which is your sum, those would now be cache hits for next iteration onwards. Is everyone following that? Now, when we talk about array indexing, array zero, array one in the accumulating sum. So again, when it goes to our, it, it now searches cache that, do you have something called as array zero? Again, it would be a cache miss. So it will go and look up in the main memory. Now, for some reason, let's say it's not even there in the main memory. It would be a page fault. So it has to go all the way to the disk now. From the disk, which is your hard drive, it would copy that data first onto the RAM so that it does not suffer from page faults in future. Now that it is in RAM, it will now take it back to the cache so that in future there is no cache miss. Once it is brought back to the cache, then it is used by the CPU from the cache to the ALU. So it takes care of the fact that if you are missing, that's fine, but make sure that in future you do not suffer from misses. Otherwise you have to go all the way at all the way to the top of your memory hierarchy, which is going to slow down your access. Does that make sense? So in terms of array, because it's an array, rather than getting array zero from the disk, it would grab chunks of memory, which is the entire array from the disk, copy it into a main memory. Now from main memory, rather than just getting array zero, is going to grab the entire array line and bring it to the cache. Why? Because array would exhibit a spatial locality. Now for next iteration, if you have to search for array one, it's going to be a cache hit, right? For array two, it's going to be a cache hit. Array three is going to be cache hit. And once your sum has been calculated, the final sum has been calculated, it updates your cache. But again, remember, cache is just a buffer. So it has to also update the sum on the main memory from where the sum was copied, right? 
and suppose in your iteration you are probably updating the contents of the array as well then it has to update that content of array onto the cache as well at the end and from the cache it has to also update the value of that array element in the main memory but also the main memory grab that array from the disk so it has to go to the disk to write onto that disk as well right so these are like passing down the copies of data and whenever the job is done at the cpu then you make sure that throughout that hierarchy all the values are updated because naturally the cache is going to get replaced depending on what is the new execution if there is a new execution of your code then the cache the data in the cache is no longer valid so something new would be grabbed from the ram and brought to the cache so you want to make sure that if there are any changes happening in the variables those are reflected all the way back to where those are basically stored does that make sense how this transition is working are there any questions in the chat that i should be looking into okay so with that we have to determine the size of the cache memory so that it can hold enough to conform to the demands of locality so the question is how much should be the cache memory right and then determine what is the unit of transfer like how much data we have to grab from the main memory and copy it into the cache right now this is this one formula which is intuitive now suppose before your looping there is a reference to a variable right suppose you are declaring your sum suppose let's say int sum equal 0 and then there is a for loop which is which is which is accumulating that sum which is sum plus equals array i right in terms of c++ so now when you declare your variable which is int sum equal to 0 then from your assembly programming you at least understand this concept that if sum is sitting on main memory it has to be brought to the cpu so that it could be assigned some value right d equal to 0 right something like that so so the first time it's looking for the variable sum the cpu is all, is like okay i'm going to run this code which is in sum equal to 0 but where is the sum i don't have the sum so it will go to the cache it would be a cache miss right so it has to go to the main memory and then it would get the data from the main memory back to the alu so if i say the time taken to access a record from main memory is called as tma then how much time does it take for how much time does it take to update your sum at the end of your calculations right so you have an you have a loop iteration of n right so if you, have, you if you have n iterations then how much is your average time to compute that accumulating sum well the formula is you miss once so it's tma but once you miss it in the cache now since you copied it onto the cache after the first miss for all the n iterations you only have to spend tca that means time to fetch a record from the cache and give it back to the alu so that is the round trip that you have to do from the cpu to the cache and back to the cpu that is tca the round trip from the cpu to the main memory and back to the cpu is called as tma so the total time taken is ntca plus tma whole divided by n which gives you the average time per iteration if your number of loops are very large if your number of loops are very large you will see that this n would drive this tma divided by n to 0 this term the second term would drive to 0 so your average time would be same as 
cash access time. And that's where you see the benefit. That's the desired ideal performance. So basically, if you have large number of iterations, it is in your best interest to save it onto the cash, right? Because if there was no cash, it has to access TMA n times. So it would be n TMA divided by n, which would have been TMA. That means average time to execute would be like thousands of clock cycles to go to the main memory. But if your cache access is like hundred of or hundreds of cycles, that is much better than spending thousands or ten thousands of clock cycles to go to the main memory. Okay, so make sure this formula is clear. Okay, any questions? Okay, let's proceed. Now, we were talking that what is that size of transfer that we need to, be, uh, that we need to consider for good locality? Well, the term we are going to use here is block. Okay, so obviously you cannot transfer one byte at a time. That would be much slower, right? So nor you would want to transfer collection of bytes. Like you do not want to transfer one word at a time, which is four bytes. So what we do is we transfer a block of memory. What is a block? It is a collection of words, right? And the typical size of block in modern caches is 64 bytes, right? It's 64 bytes. If we say that one word is four bytes, we are basically saying 16 words at a time. Right? If one word is four bytes or 32 bits, we are basically saying we are transferring 16 words at a time. So that is called as a block. So a block of memory is taken from the RAM and then copied onto the cache. That means you have to design cache so that it can hold these blocks of memory. Right. So that gives you some idea of what is the size of the cache. Okay. So the key word here is block. So there we had this term called as page in virtual memory, which was like few KBs, like the standard one is four KB. So here the standard, uh, so, so here the standard is like, you're going to get a block, which is like 64 bytes at a time. This chart here describes the process of grabbing a data from the cache or the main memory, depending on if it's a miss or a hit. Okay, so we have verbally discussed all this. I'm going to just show you how this relates to our discussion. And if there are any questions, let me know. Okay, the first chart here talks about reading. If you want to read a data from the memory because it's going to be used in some calculation, the lower flow chart, the bottom flow chart talks about writing a value onto the memory. That means once you have computed a value, you want to store and update the contents of that variable onto the memory. Okay. So we're going to first read about, first talk, discuss about reading a value. That means the request is made from the CPU to grab some data or a variable from the memory. So now the CPU issues a virtual address. Then the page table. So the CPU issues the virtual address for the target location of that variable. Right. So this page table would convert the virtual address to a physical address. Right. So physical address means it now has a definite location to look into. Now, the first stage is your cache, okay? Your physical address is sent to the cache memory. If that is present on cache, it is a read hit. That means it's a hit, a read hit. If it is a read hit, the data is read from the cache and it is sent back to the CPU for calculation. But suppose the 
physical address that that variable or the data is not on cache it would be called as read miss because you are attempting to, attempting to read but it's not there on the cache so what's the next level is the main memory ram right so it will go to the main memory now if it exists in the main memory right then a block of data is fetched from the main memory okay as we discussed just a slide earlier any time it needs to issue a data from the main memory it will talk in terms of blocks so if even though the target here is one specific ram location but it's going to send in a block which contains that ram location so it will send in the block from the main memory then that block of memory is going to be written onto the cache line and then the cache would would say oh now it is present in the cache so it will now send the data here right now suppose it's not there even in the main memory this is called as page fault that means spend millions of cycles now to go all the way to the hard drive hdd or ssd right so the virtual address takes you to the drive then you read the page from the drive then you update your memory so your now memory would have the page from the disk so we discussed it last time if there is a page fault os will go all the way to the hard drive get that page put it into the physical memory and then update the page table so that now in future there will, there will always be a page hit right does it, that's does the it, process um okay. does it save it as a block or is it just it's a page it? it's a okay, page it's a page it's page is being read from the drive and the page is being stored on the memory because so, before today's lecture there was no cache so we were talking only at the last two levels until tuesday right so the, so this this cycle is to deal with pages the last two stages are with pages now that the page from the disk is loaded then a block from that page is taken and then put onto the cache and then that record that you need from the cache that target variable or the target location that you need from the block that, that then the data is read from that cache onto the cpu so from the hard drives a page is stored on the main memory from the main memory a smaller unit which is called as a block is taken onto the cache why smaller because as you are going to the cpu your memory sizes are decreasing your main memory is smaller in size than your hard drive so you you send in the page which has that block from that page you send in that block which has your target address now once you are at once the block is stored on the cache now you can grab the exact address that you intended to from the cache does that make sense similarly with write you want to write the updated value like after your sum has been calculated right the uh, the accumulating sum you need to now update the record of sum in the memory what do you do you issue a virtual address of the target location in the main memory where you want to save the new sum that virtual to physical address translation takes place now if that target location is recorded on cache it would be called as write hit so then cpu is going to write the data on the cache right but but if it is not if the target location is not on the cache it would be called as write miss okay so it will go to the memory right now if it is there in the memory right it will be called as page hit so this logic is called as write miss and page hit that means you are missing from the cache but at least it exists on the main memory so it's write miss and and that means logical and page hit so under that condition your data is going to be written onto the main memory right but if your main memory does not have that target location where you want to save that value 
then it would suffer from page fault that means go to the drive read the page from the drive and then write miss and page fault under this condition you are now going to write the cpu value onto that target value Does that make sense just look and look look into these logical operations you are going to write onto the memory only if it's a write miss on the cache and it's a page hit on the memory is there ever a situation where the drive is the destination yes so so in that case if drive is the destination so see anything that you have to do has to be first loaded onto the main memory that is the gold standard when we talked about assembly whatever calculations you do you want to store it onto the main memory when we introduced the virtual memory we again said the same thing everything has to be loaded onto the ram as long as that process is active right so as long as you're running that application your ram needs to store that running process of course if your destination is to so drive is something like if your value is now updated to the main memory then it can be stored on the drive but if you remember any time your application is running so if you talk about sum it's a kind of a variable which needs to be activated on the stack only when that application is running right but when you close that application you do not want to work with these local variables anymore so in those cases those local variables do not have a permanent location on the drive but when you talk about like saving your edit saving your work on some editor right so when you write something on microsoft office or any editor and when you save it and switch switch off your computer that data is still saved when you switch on the computer next time so what happens that data either is stored on the cloud from which it recovers it or it is stored on your hard drive it's never active in your ram so in those cases of course after your memory it needs to be transferred to the hard drive if you do if you want to retain those content after your power down does that answer your question yes it does okay so these are so so whatever i have said verbally uh if you want to follow it formally please uh, read read this uh, uh in your preparation so that you can follow back what this diagram is saying so here we are talking about all the cpu read uh, write and read okay now let's take some examples of how all these things work right so you have your main memory which which is let's say 60 256 bytes only okay it's it's like peanuts <laughs> and this is your main memory right so like 20 years back or 30 years back it was still a lot right so that right now today the gold standard is like 8 gb or 16 gb maybe older computers might have 4 gb but as far as i remember when i was like like i remember working with like megabytes of ram way back in two early to like early 2000s in my undergrad if you have a 2 gb ram like 2010 around 2010 if you have, if you have like 2 gb computer like wow <laughs> right <laughs> now now my current laptop which i purchased in 2015 okay is a uh, 8 gb ram but most probably many of you might have a 16 gb ram as well okay but you won't have higher than 16 gb ram in your laptops at least but if you have your desktops uh then you probably might have like 24 gb ram or something like that right so this is an example of just a 256 byte memory so on your left how is this 256 byte memory arranged now if you recall our discussions from lecture 13 it's in a 2d layout here so 256 byte is arranged in 64 blocks and each block is 4 byte that means you have 
64 entries starting from bottom to top and then you have four columns which is each cell is a byte that means every block is storing 32 bits which is four bytes okay one byte is eight bits remember that so now if you want to address any one cell or any one uh, byte in this grid in this memory grid okay suppose my arrow is pointing here which is at block 63 byte 0 then every cell would have an address right hopefully you uh, this question was asked in the previous take home quiz that take home quiz 10 the last question was all about this so if i'm pointing here it is in block 63 byte 0 so now if you look into this you have 256 bytes right so how many address bits do you need for addressing each cell how many address bits would you need for 256 bytes if it's a byte addressable you need 8 bits so your memory address is an 8 bit wide so here you're seeing an 8 bit wide right now how many bytes do you have in every block four so how many bits do you need to find the byte index can you write down in the chat I'm how sorry, many bits can you repeat the question again i'm still like writing everything down so you have is everyone else following okay so you have 64 uh, rows which we called as blocks and every column here is a byte right so it's a block comma byte the coordinate is block comma byte right so we understood that we need 8 bits of address to go to any coordinate right if it helps you to understand any coordinate or any grid or any byte here now out of those 8 bits i have to identify how many bits are assigned to byte index and how many bits are assigned to the block index so if my cursor is pointing to this 63 comma 0 right then what do you think like how many bits do i need to know the byte index i need two bits why because there are four bytes 0 1 2 3 so i need two bits from the address space which gives me the indication of byte how many bits do i need to know the block number 8 no 8 6 log 64 to the base 2 because 0 to 63 so these number these decimal numbers can be represented using 6 bits 0 1 2 3 these four numbers can be represented using 2 bits in total i have 8 bits so see byte offset is the lower 2 bits and the higher 6 bits are your block number right so if i am pointing here your byte in offset would be 0 0 and since this is 63 all your 6 bits of the block number would be 11111 right because five ones give you six ones give you 63 right so examples if i have this address which is 0111110 given that memory address i can fly, find the block number and byte number so your byte offset just look at the lower two 0 0 so byte 0 block 31 so this address is referring to block 31 byte 0 this one where the arrow is pointing you guys see the arrow yeah we can see yeah so you guys see the arrow right so i checked in the class if students are seeing that So this is thirty one comma zero or block thirty one byte zero. Again, block forty eight byte two, right? Two means one zero, so it would be in the second column, and then the block number is forty eight, so it would be forty eight comma two. This one. So understood. So like that, we can understand how this memory layout works. Okay. another example i have 128 byte memory 
Now this is organized as 16 cross 8. Right, this is organized as 16 cross 8. Okay, K0 to K15 are your 16 blocks. B0 to B7 are your 8 bytes. And then I have labeled few random bytes here as A, B, C, D, E. Right. Now, just looking at this question, how many address bits do you need in total? Remember, it's a 128 byte memory. How many address bits do you need? You can write in chat. It's important that you participate because if you do not participate right now, it's going to, you have to do the hard task of reviewing these slides again, going over the recording again, and then preparing yourself. Okay. You need seven bits. How? Log 128 to the base two. So you, your memory address is seven bits. How many bits do you need to find the byte offset from these seven? We need three bits because we have eight columns. So byte offset is zero to seven. So I need three bits. So the lower three bits from the seven bit address is byte. Then the remaining four bits should be the block. Well, no prizes for guessing. Indeed, you just need four bits from zero to 15. Right? So in this case, there are four bits. The higher four bits are for the block number. The lower three bits are for the byte offset. So with that, we can find out what this each memory is representing. This is reviewing that lecture 13. Okay, the same question was asked in the previous take home quiz. Okay, so, so far this review works fine, right? To be able to partition your physical, so this is your main memory. So when you get physical address, you can partition that physical address in terms of byte and block. Right, so if I'm talking about A, label A, it is block 14 byte 5. Block boot 14 byte 5. So its memory address is this, seven bits of memory address. So likewise, I hope you can understand all this, right? E is sitting on byte zero, block five. So first five, which is represented at zero, one, zero, one, and the lower three are byte zero. Right. Now let's introduce our cache memory. Okay, let's introduce our cache memory. So it's a new, phys it's, a, it's like a new memory. It's an actual memory. So let's assume that we have a cache memory with four entries and each entry is composed of eight bytes for a total of 32 bytes. So the structure you see here, you have, this, you have some bytes. That means the cache is storing eight bytes in every line. So, so the terminology block is reserved for main memory. In cache, we call it as a line. So cache have cache lines, memory has memory blocks. Does that make sense? So a row in cache is called as cache line. So your cache line zero, one, two, three. So in total, you have four times eight, 32 bytes of memory for cache. Does that make sense? So again, there's a disclaimer. Sometimes it's called as cache block or cache line, but the correct terminology is cache line, right? So L0 to L3. Apart from this cache memory, there is a small map called as tag, okay? And we will understand why it is there. So, so far, the only thing you have to understand is this cache memory, eight cross four, right? And then we'll talk about why do we need some tag. So as seen, the cache is one fourth the size of our memory. Memory was 128. Memory was 128 bytes. Cache was 32 bytes. That means you cannot store the entire main memory onto the cache. You can only store one fourth of the main memory at a time. 
That means if you want to fully occupy your cache, at best, you can only store one fourth of your main memory. That means the cache and the main memory have to talk in terms of how much data I can grab from the main memory so that it fits my cache. Now, it should not come as a surprise that number of bytes in each cache block is same as number of bytes in each cache line. What does that tell you? Any idea? What does it tell you? It means that anytime you want to grab a cache block, you have to grab the entire cache block, which is eight bytes, and bring it to one of these cache lines. That means if you're picking one block, just pick the entire block. That means all the eight bytes, because the cache gives you that capacity to store the entire block in one line. So a block or that block line is equivalent to the cache line, basically. So, so a block of memory can fit into this cache line. So one block fits into one line. Does that okay. make sense? Yeah. Now, if my cache had 16 bytes, suppose I had 16 bytes in a cache in every line, then it can store two blocks in every cache line. Does that make sense? Uh-huh. Okay, it should be intuitive, right? So at this stage, right now it's a direct mapping. You grab any one block and you can store it in any available cache line. This, this kind of logic where you can grab any block from the memory and store it in any of the available cache lines, this kind of cache is called as fully associative cache organization. So based on this metric that where can you store a block of memory onto the cache line? If it can be stored any at any cache line, such an organization is called as fully associative cache. That means a block of memory may be brought to any line in the cache. That means if you want to grab block 14, 15, 7, 5, then probably you're storing block 14 in line two, right? You're storing block 15 in line zero. You're storing block seven in the available, which is line one. And the only available line is L3. So you're storing block five in L3, right? So in that regard, can you see what the tags are storing? What is a tag? The tag is the uh, the block from memory. Exactly. The tag is just like the name tag. So every block has been tagged. So if you want to look into L3, the tag for L3 is 0101, which means block five. So blo the tag looks works as a lookup table. You look into the tag. If you see, remember I was talking that, I was telling you that CPU needs to first look into the cache if the target destination is available on the cache, how does it know? It actually checks this lookup table called as tag. So it knows that, oh, my destination is block five. Now, how do I know block five is already mapped to the cache? I have to go to the tag and check every tag in that lookup table. So I have four entries in my tag, right? I have four entries in my tag. So can you see that number of tag entries is same as number of cache lines? If you have four cache lines, each cache line has its tag, which gives you an indication that which block is being stored in that line. So if I'm looking for block five, I will compare every tag and there is a hit. And that's, what, that's how I say it's a cache hit because I see a tag 0101 as the first, L, as, the, as, as, as L3 entry. So I know I can only, I can see, look into the L3 cache line. But if I'm looking for block five, then it go, so, sorry, I suppose I'm looking for block 14, right? Now, 14 is what? 1110, triple one zero. It looks into the first tag. It does not match. It looks into the second tag. Luckily it matches. So it's a cache hit. What about block seven? 
the first tag it does not match the next tag it does not match the third tag it it matches right suppose i say block 10 i want to look for block 10 now it goes through all the four tags there is no entry in that tag for block 10 this is called as cache miss now it can be read miss or write miss depending on what is your purpose with the cache if you want to read the data from the cache such a cache miss is called as read miss but if your purpose was to write a data onto the cache that cache miss would be called as write miss does that make sense now can you tell me what is the problem with a fully associative design it has to check every record in the tag great and how do we check there is a comparators logic there is a compare so there is a actual hardware which is a comparator it compares if the two values match or not right so that means if you have a fully associative design you have to have a new hardware called as comparator logic and your and your destination needs to be compared to each entry in the tag in this fully associative design which is time consuming so okay so 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 since that's the problem with this fully associative cache then there are new cache designs available which saves you time from comparing all tag entries right so before we introduce that let's go over some of these uh, questions here related to fully associative so in our example the number of blocks in memory is 16 right so we have 16 blocks of memory right so how many tag bits do we need so tag entry is 4 bits if you see each entry in a tag that is controlled by how many maximum blocks you have your memory had 16 blocks that means for block index 15 you should be able to represent it as 1111 that means you need minimum 4 bits so your num so each entry in your tag is 4 bits right so if your if your number of block was 256 then you would need 8 bits for the tag right log 256 to the base 2 so your number of blocks if you take the log of number of blocks to the base 2 that will tell you how many and how many bits are there in each tag entry right so let's see this question in a 256 kb cache with line size of 32b how many lines are there Okay. So the total cache size is two fifty six KB, and line size is thirty two bytes. That means it is storing thirty two bytes in every line. Then how many cache lines are there? You simply divide the two. Two fifty six KB divided by thirty two B, which is two raised to power eighteen divided by two raised to power five, which is two raised to power. Two raised to power eighteen, right? Two fifty six KB is ten and eight. Two raised to power eighteen divided by two raised to power five, which is two raised to power thirteen, which is eight K. So you have eight K cache lines. That means eight into one thousand twenty four. So you have that many cache lines. Now the second part of the question is, if memory was eight MB, like the main memory was eight MB. what would be the number of tag bits so if 8 mb is the total memory size and i know that it, so the golden rule here is the line size is same as block size if there are 8 here if it's not mentioned then it's it also means there are 8 bytes in a block so if your line if your line size is 32 bytes that means your blocks each block also has 32 bytes in the main memory so can we find the number of blocks in main memory 
it is 8 MB divided by 32 bytes. That will give you number of rows or number of blocks in the main memory. So what is 8 MB divided by 32 B? 8 M is 2 raised to power 23 divided by 2 raised to power 5, which is 2 raised to power 18. So you have 2 raised to power 18 blocks. So how many tag bits do you need? Log of number of blocks to the base 2, which is 18. So you need 18 bits to denote a single tag for each block. Is this clear? So far, so good. Okay, you need to work it out. Okay, right now it's easier for me to say because I understand it. But for you, please go over this question again and please try to solve. Do not look into the answer. Try to solve based on what the question is trying to say. Because in the exam or testing environment, you will not have answer to understand what the question is saying. You have to understand what the question is saying to know the answer. So here the assumption is the line size is same as block size. That means number of columns is same. So find the number of rows. Right. So tag bits is log of number of cache blocks to the base two, which is 18. Uh, OK, so. I have five minutes, so let's uh, revisit this issue of fully associative memory that the great thing about fully associative cache is you don't have to think a lot. If you see a cache line available, you go to the memory, grab that block, and copy it into that cache line. Right? But that flexibility comes at a cost where you need to now compare every tag entry to know if it is there on the cache or not. So there is no smart way of knowing so far. If you have, how many cache lines were there? 8K cache lines in this example. So number of entries in your tag are 8K. There are 8K tags. So, so for any check on the cache, you have to compare 8K tags going over every record to check if it is there or not. So that means there is a comparator circuit which compares it, right? So that is going to be like a lot of hardware resources, right? And then it is also going to make it slower. If it is at the very last tag entry, you have to go worst at order of 8K checks, right? So you have to go through every record. Now you can do anything like in terms of logic of it's basically searching. It's a basically searching logic, right? So at the worst case, you're doing order of 8K, order of N, right? Now look into this, what it's trying to say, right? In this example, you have four cache lines. Every line is eight bytes. If you have this address, 0101000, from that address, you should be able to find out what is, what is the byte offset and what is the block number, right? So right now, if you see there are eight bytes, so you need three bits for your byte index. So the last three gives you the byte index, right? And the, and the first four gives you the tag. It's the block number, right? It gives you the tag. So you check, you take 0101, and then you check this tag 0101 against every entry on the tag. And suppose the tag table, the lookup table here is already filled up. That means block number five is stored in L3, block number 14 is stored in L2, block number 15 is stored in L0, block number seven is stored in L1. So if you're looking for something which is five here, right? It's going to match. So it's going to show a hit. So it's, see, it's, go, it's checking here sequentially. It checks the first entry, second entry. So one, zero, zero. So the moment it shows a hit, the, you know it's, ex, it exists on the cache. The destination exists in a cache.
Yeah, but at the worst case, you have to check all the records, right? Yeah, but then you need those many hardware resources to check, right? There are a lot of gates. Every plus, every cross here is a comparator circuit, right? So with 8K lines of fully associative cache, we'll need around 8K comparators. 8K is around 8,000, right? 8 into 1,024 is around 8,000. So you need 8,000 comparators for parallel comparison, right? It's a parallel comparison, right? And of course, you need to store all the tag bits, right? Because that means here, all your tag bits are already stored before you compare, right? So the solution that was proposed is direct mapping. Now, how direct mapping works is instead of randomly putting any cache block into any available cache line, let's add some metric. And that metric was called as modulo operator. So what does modulo mean? Modulo basically means remainder. Four modulo two is zero. Five modulo two is one. That means what is the remainder? So A modulo B means A remainder of A divided by B. So the logic they proposed was, let's not put any cache block at any cache line. What we are going to do is, you give me number of cache lines. If there are four cache lines, then my denominator becomes four. Now, if my block number, then divide the block number with total number of cache lines. The remainder is basically where you want to map that block. Okay. So simply put, if this is your line zero, line one, line two, line three, that means if there are four cache lines, L0, L1, L2, L3 are basically the four possible remainders when you divide anything by four. So you bring any block number. So if you have to map block number 15 onto this cache line, L0, L1, L2, L3. Now it should not go anywhere. In a direct mapping, it should go to the line number, which is 15 modulo four, which is three. So it, will, it can only go into line three. Now, if you play with seven, if you want to store block number seven on the cache, then it does not go anywhere on the cache. Now it should go into seven modulo four, which is three, right? Now, if something is already sitting at three, it needs to be removed so that this new block can sit there. So that becomes the demerit of direct caching or direct mapping compared to fully associative. But the benefit is every set of blocks now have a dedicated cache line to go into. That means block number one, block number five, block number nine, block number 13. All these are modulo one. All, all these blocks give remainder one when divided by four. So all these would be mapped to only line one, but block number four, so block number zero, four, eight, 12, 16 are all mapped to line zero because the remainder is zero. Does that make sense? So there are only four remainders possible if you have four cache lines. Now, if I give you like eight cache lines, then it is modulo eight comparison. That means take the block number divided by eight, whatever the remainder is, that line, that cache line is where that block can go into. Okay, so I'll end the lecture here, well, like introducing the direct mapping, but please uh, go ahead and read this entire slides before Tuesday. So we have our last week of lectures next week. So my plan is to finish this cash discussion and then talk about pipelining, which is our last topic. Okay, so we'll be taking lectures both on Tuesday and Thursday. In the meantime, uh, hopefully you might have got a link for course evaluation. This time I think we are following a new website. So I would really appreciate if you can spend time filling that course evaluation. 
uh, that would be quite helpful for me to know how uh, we manage this semester with everything moving online. And also it would help me uh, to see like the areas where I did well and where I could improve as I would be applying for faculty positions for next year. So it would be like very helpful if you could spend time and see what new things we have introduced in this course compared to your other courses, or if there is something that we could improve based on your experience from other online courses. So please uh, let me know through that official feedback. I'll be posting that link sometime next Tuesday, like in the Tuesday's lecture as well. Wait, we're not using Peak anymore? No, we're not using Peak. I think there's a new link. Why oh. must they do this to us? <laughs> I'll share that link in Tuesday's lecture and give you some time in the class lecture to fill it up. Okay. But if you get to get hold of that link earlier, please fill it up. I would probably would want everyone to fill it up so that we can have uh, like I can have a good assessment of how we did in this class. Okay, thank you so much. So uh, your quiz on virtual memory goes live at 8 p.m. Okay, and pl please submit it before 8 p.m. tomorrow. All right, so uh, have a great weekend and I'll see you guys on Tuesday for our last week of classes. Okay, take care. If there are any questions, let me know, I'm still here. This is more of a, like a hunch that I wanna just confirm, but. All right, so uh, let's continue our discussion. So a quick recap. So cache is a kind of an actual memory which sits between your CPU and your RAM. And the purpose of your cache is to store data or copy data from the RAM so that access time is reduced. So your operations get quicker if you have to just visit a cache rather than going all the way to the main memory to fetch or write your data. So in that spirit, let's take this example layout. If you have a main memory of 128 bytes, which are arranged as 16 cross eight format, then you have 16 memory blocks labeled zero till 15, and then you have eight bytes labeled zero to seven, right? So you have, you have a 16 cross eight grid. Every cell in that grid is one byte. So it's easy to calculate the number of physical address bits, because if you have 128 bytes, you take a log two of 128, you end up having seven bits, right? So if you take those seven bits, that means each cell in this diagram is correspond has a seven bit address, right? And now, say, uh, if we count the number of blocks, we have 16 blocks. So if we take those seven bits, based on your number of blocks, you can find out how many bits do you need to address a block. So log 16 to base two is four bits. And if you look at the number of columns or the number of bytes you have in each block, so it's a block size. So block size is eight bytes here. That means each block has eight bytes, which is like each row. So the number of bits to address a byte within a block is three. So four plus three makes up seven, right? So the lower three bits are assigned a byte offset and the higher four bits or assigned your block number, right? And this is important to understand why byte offset are the lower three bits, okay? This concept should be very clear to you because you first go to a block number. That means if you go to block 15, then you have the four higher bits are one, 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 one. That means with four higher bits as one, 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 you have eight possible combinations with lower bits. All those eight are sitting here. That's why the lower three bits are your byte offset, the higher four bits are your block number. Now, if you look into the map of how a cache memory looks like, well, if you have a cache memory with you, which has 32 bytes, right? And which is arranged in a four cross eight format. Now for all practical purposes, your block size is always same as a line size. So, the rows in your cache are generally called as cache lines. 
few literature might call it as cash blocks, but just to be sure that we do not confuse the two, in this course, we are calling these as cash lines. So practically speaking, every the block size is same as line size so that it's straightforward to copy one block at a time and then save it on one cache line directly, right? So if you have eight bytes, then you have four cache lines. Now, if we look into our uh, address, memory address bits, that means every value here or every cell here can be mapped to this cache. But in reality, out of these 16 blocks, you can only map four blocks, right? So how do we map a memory, how do we map any memory block into a cache? Well, it depends and it, and, and, the, and it depends why, because cache has three different designs, right? So if your computer has a fully associative cache, right? So there are like three types of cache designs, right? And that is how your computers are generally pre-configured, right? These are not like on the fly configuration you can do. So they are already configured when it's shipped to you. So that the three designs are fully associative, direct mapping, which we discussed last time, we'll review these two, and these two sit on the two extremes. The middle ground is called as set associative. It functions both like fully associative and direct mapping. That means it basically takes the benefits of both fully associative and direct mapping while like eliminating all these uh, issues which arise from fully associative or direct mapping. So we're going to do a quick review. So the ruling, if, if you have a fully associative design, the rule is any, you see uh, like my keyword here is random. That means any block in your main memory can be mapped to any line on the cache which is available, right? So that's why it's random. If you have a space available in your cache line, you just put it there, right? So there is no rule, okay? Now, yeah, okay. So, so that, that, is the, that is the definition of why, why I say it's a random mapping. Direct mapping means every memory block has a specified line number to go to for cache. That means rather than having a random assignment, each of these memory blocks has a predefined cache line, which we call as index, okay? So, and the way we calculate that index is we use a hash function and that hash function or hash mapping is basically a modulo operator. So if you take the block number and you take a modulo operation with number of cache lines, the value you get is the index for that mapping. So if you take block zero and number of cache lines are four. So if you take zero modulo four, the remainder is, zero modulo four means the remainder when zero is divided by four, it's zero. That means block zero is always going to be mapped to line zero. Similarly, block four, will also be mapped to line zero. Similarly, zero, four, eight, 12. All of these four cache blocks are going to be mapped to L zero and no cache line and no other cache line. Similarly, block number one, five, nine, and 13 are always be mapped to L one, right? So you have a pattern, right? So the benefit of direct mapping and that's why I call it as unique because you already know the destination, right? And I'll also talk about the benefits and demerits of that, right? So, and, and set associative is something new which we want to uh, talk about today. I call it as uniquely random. That means there is some portion of uniqueness somewhere and there is some portion of randomness. Now to think of how we design a set associative cache, well, a set is defined as collection of cache lines, right? 
So in this case, if I tell you that a set has two cache lines, then we can say that from this cache memory, we basically have two sets. L0 and L1 can be one set and L2 and L3 can be another set. So such a set associative cache is called as two-way set associative cache. So two ways, that means the number two basically denotes how many cache lines are there in a given set. So if I tell you that, that it's a three-way set associative, that means every set has three cache lines. So if I give you an example of a two-way set associative, then basically this cache can be thought of as having two sets and within a set, you have two cache lines. But the two way comes from the fact that you have two lines in a given set. So if I give you four lines in a cache and I tell you it's a two way set associative, then what you can do is simply do four divided by two to find out number of sets. Does that make sense? Now, another example, let's say we have a cache which has eight cache lines. And I tell you that this cache is configured as two-way set associative, then how many sets do we have? You, you have four, right? Because you have eight cache lines and two-way set associative means sets of two. That means you have four sets. Similarly, the same example, eight cache lines. If I ask you, it's a four-way set associative design, then how many sets do you have? You have two sets and each set has four cache lines. Now, why do I call it as uniquely random? Well, the unique part comes from direct mapping. So, so the element which does a direct mapping in set associative is that a given memory block is uniquely mapped to one of these sets. But within a set, it can be mapped to any of the cache lines. So that brings in the fully associated feature, right? That's why I call it as uniquely random. First find a unique set and within that set, it's a random placement. So if you have, in this case, if you have two sets, suppose L0 and L1 make up set zero, let's call it as S0 and L2 and L3 make up set one, which is S1, right? Then any cache, any memory block has a predetermined set index, S0 or S1. It's fixed. But within S0, you have two lines. Within S1, you have two lines. Once you have uniquely identified a set, within that set, whatever cache line is available, you can map it, right? So it's like the combination of fully and direct mapping, right? So, a quick recap on fully associative cache. So any block maps to any cache line and each cache line has a tag. So this rule exists for all cache lines. Every cache line has a tag, right? A tag memory where the tag of that line is stored, right? Now tag, the tag value is basically the block number in fully associative cache. That means if you have these seven bits, now by our definition that we have eight bytes in a cache line or a block line or, or a memory block, you have three bits reserved for byte offset. Now that's not going to change. So be it a fully associative design, set associative design, direct mapping, your lower three bits in these examples are always going to be byte offset because that denote how many bytes you have in a given cache line, right? So it's always going to be eight in all in the examples we are taking. Now, the higher four bits were block number, but if it's a fully associative design, then since any block can map to any line, right? So these higher four bits are called as tag, right? So what it means is, 
if you map any random memory block to any cache line, you can look into those higher four bits that would denote the tag value for that corresponding line. So if I say that block zero is mapped to line two, then line two is having all these eight bytes, but then to check who is occupying L2, you need to check the tag bits, right? So that gives you an indication which family is sitting inside L2. So that would be family of zero because what's the block number for zero? Four zeros, right? So using a tag, we kind of probe into these cache lines to see if that memory exists or not, right? So suppose I want to read a data from memory and bring it to a cache. Now I'm doing some operation where I need to revisit a memory location, right? So I look into that cache and I search if that look if that if that requested memory is stored in a give in some cache line. So how I'm going to check that? Well, I will take the higher four bits, which are the tag bits of the requested memory, and compare it with all the tag values. So you have four bits of tag which are pre-stored here, right? And then you have a comparator. You have a comparator circuit, which compares these two, right? And wherever I see a match, the or, or ring would give you a true hit. That means the requested memory address is located in cache because there's a match for a tag. But in case your requested memory address does not give any match. That means hit is false. That means the corresponding memory block is not allocated to the cache. It would be called as cache miss. So you have to go all the way back to the. So, so now what will happen is now, if it, if it does not match any of the tags, that means you have to remove some cache line so that you can make way for the requested memory because your program needs it, right? So we'll talk about what is the policy of eliminating or removing a, a mapped memory or a mapped block from the cache, right? Now, if you see this diagram, right? It's, it's kind of intuitive, why? Because if you see the byte offset, that is used to select one of these eight bytes. Right, so every cache line, you can select a given column. So the output of these four muxes is basically a column. But based on that tag, you want to only take that entry from that requested cache line. So you have something called as four into two encoder, right? You have like four, so you, so in these cache lines, there would be a hit. So there will be only one hit in out, out of these four because all the tags are uniquely stored in these tag spaces. Does that make sense? So to find out, this is zero, one, two, three, the numbering. So to find out where, which line there is a match, we should have a four into two encoder. And then these two bits would be helping us figure out which cache line I should be taking out. And once I get that value that I can take out the data, which is one byte data from here. Okay, so try to un make, understand this because this is where one of the major drawbacks of fully associative cache comes in. The fact that you have to have a comparator circuit for parallel comparison which is an extra area and a power overhead. And because of that, you need to have a four cross two encoder. Okay. So, so, yeah. So a general formula that you would probably would want to understand. Now, if you understand how the mapping works, this formula is just a generalization. So if you have K blocks in memory, 
you have L cash lines and B bytes per block. Your number of offset bits is log B to the base two, and your block bits are basically your tag bits, right? So all tags are compared to block number in parallel. There's a comparator per line to check in parallel. That means lots of hardware area and power overhead, right? So you want to do better than this. Then we, last time we discussed that, okay, how about let's assign a predefined index to every memory block. That means rather than going randomly to any location, can we predetermine the target line number or the line index? Because we want to save ourselves from doing these multiple comparisons. So the best way is to avoid these one-on-one -on -one check. So I should already know where my destination is so that I don't have to search the tag table or the tag memory to see if that memory exists or not in that cache. Now the way direct mapping works is the unique cache line. So uniqueness is in terms of index. So the index is find out the block number. So if you are mapping block number zero, right? So block number is zero mod number of cache lines, which is four. So zero mod four is zero. So if you do a modulo four operation here, then you would have four possible remainders, zero, one, two, three. Similarly, if you have L cache lines, the possible index values would be zero till L minus one, right? So if you have possible index values from zero till L minus one, then how many bits do you need for index? Log L to the base two, right? So in that same spirit, your offset bits don't change. It's log B to the base two. If you have L cache lines, then your block number, the block bits are now subdivided into index bits and tag bits. So index bits is based on how many cache lines you have, L. So log L to the base two is your index bits. Now, if you subtract the block bits minus your index bits, the remaining higher bits are called as tag bits. Okay, so if I can zoom in here. So this entire three to six was block number for the memory. But now, since I have four cache lines, I can find out number of index bits, which are two. So three index, so, so bit three and four are now reserved as index bits and the remaining two bits are now called as tag. So there is no way of calculating tag. Tag bits are always calculated through subtraction method because it's, it's because you can directly calculate the block number, the number of block bits. You can directly calculate number of index bits, subtract the two, you will always get the number of tag bits. Right. So if you compare it with fully associative, earlier your tag bits was log k to the base two, which is the same as block bits. So now with a direct mapping, the amount of tag you're going to store in this tag entry has reduced. So from four, you only have two bits as a tag value, right? And in terms of diagram, this is how the mapping works. It's color coded. So zero, four, eight, and 12 are the red family. They're always getting mapped to L0. 15, 11, seven, three are your blue family. They're always getting mapped to L3. And for the purpose of this diagram, I've not shown the remaining two families. Okay, so that it's readable, right? Similarly, you will have L1, which is the gray family and L2, which is your orange family, right? So now, if you see what is the benefit of direct uh, mapping. Firstly, your tag bits has reduced because some of those bits are now taken by index. And now, since you already know which tag entry to look into, now you do not have to go through each tag entry to compare, which was the case with fully associated. That was a bad 
choice. You now you can use this index bits in a multiplexer to figure out which tag entry you need to take out from this table. And that has to be compared with the requested tag. So the tag table has tags of cache lines already mapped. And this is a requested address. So you are comparing the tag of the requested address with the ones existing already existing, right? So suppose L0 was already mapped. Now suppose the request is coming for L12, right? request is coming for L12. So now what would happen is, if you see here, this index is going to take in zero because L0, because block zero and block 12, both of those have index zero, right? You can say that 12 is what, one, one, zero, zero. And what is block zero, 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 zero. So both of them share the index. So when you take the index as zero, zero, this line, which is the tag of block zero is going to come out through this blue line. So this one is zero, zero, the higher two bits, right? But the higher two bits of 12 is one, one. And that would be a mismatch. So if your access pattern is like zero, four, eight, 12, then it's tough luck because all of these happen to map to the same cache line. So that is the one disadvantage of direct mapping. If your cache accesses, if a memory accesses happens to map you to the same cache line, you always have to remove the earlier cache entry to put in your new entry, even though remaining three cache lines might be empty. Whereas in fully associative, if entry was filled up, you could always fill up one of those remaining three. Okay. I hope you can understand the differences in direct mapping. The worst case scenario is your cache access happens to be from the same family of memory blocks, right? Now see, now let's talk about the benefit. The benefit you can straight away see visually, you need only one comparator. So if you have 20 cache lines, instead of having 20 comparators in fully associative, you're only going to work with one comparator always. That is a drastic reduction in number of comparators. And in modern computers, your cache lines go up till 128K, right? So now you can imagine that fully associative is never configured. But direct mapping is also not configured. Why? Because of the issue just I told you. If your access patterns happens to be like, you're always getting a cache miss. So that would be a cache miss. If zero is already sitting there, block four comes in, it will not match the tag because it will always look for L zero line. It would be a cache miss. So now evict block zero and insert block four. Now suppose the next entry is block eight. Again, it's a cache miss because the tags will not match. So evict block four, and insert block eight. So every time you have to evict, insert, evict, insert, which is time consuming. Because when you are evicting something, you're going to put it back into the main memory. So it will suffer a memory access time. So you want to avoid, so the goal is to avoid as many cache misses as possible through the designs, right? And the remaining part of the circuit I've drawn here, again, I've drawn it on the right-hand side for clarity. Again, you have eight bytes coming into these muxes. These muxes are controlled by your byte offset, right? And once you have one of those four bytes, the, the target is selected by your index. The same index helps you take the output from a particular cache line, right? So eventually you get one byte output, okay? So I would want to pa uh, pause here and talk about and see if there are any queries that you might have so far. What if we have an eight cache line and it's a three way? Well, that would be a bad choice in terms of designing. That's why it's never designed. But in that case, the rule is you have three way. So that means create sets of three, right? 
So you will have two sets, which has six, and then one set, which is two. I don't think it would be, it would be valid in terms of designing such a hash. Um, can you scroll up a bit, please, so I can. Oh, thank you. Oh, no, no. Yeah, that. Thank you. Can I proceed? Yeah. Okay, so here is that disclaimer. If block 2, 6, 10, 14 also happens to be the same family. Example, right? Okay, uh, let me take you to an example which I have inserted. So please be uh, careful today, virtual memory and all the cache memory uh, class notes have been re-uploaded with more annotations and examples. So if you are storing all these files locally, I would request you to like re-download all these files. Okay, because you would have seen that there, there have been few additional pages I've inserted with few examples or more clarifications on my own notes. Let's take an example, right? So I'm only going to show you this question and talk about how to proceed with this. So suppose we have a four, and you can try to solve it from your understanding. In a four MB cache and an eight GB memory with a block size of 32 bytes, what are the number of bits allocated to tag, index, and byte offset for an address in a direct map and a fully associative cache? So if you have two cache designs, which is direct mapping and fully associative, then find out for each of these cache designs, how many bits are reserved for tags, tag, index, and byte offset. Now, first of all, what you have to think is, like, let's start with block size, okay? Because block size gives you byte offset. So you have 32 bytes of block size, which is usually same for cache line as well, right? That is number of bytes per cache line because the entire block can fit into the cache in one go. So, your block size is 32 bytes. Number of memory blocks is K as per our formulae. And how do we calculate number of memory blocks? Total memory divided by block size. So you have eight GB memory and you have 32 bytes in every block. So if you divide the two, you get number of blocks, which is 256 M, right? Number of cache lines is L, that is cache size divided by block size. Now block size is the same as line size. So again, denominator is 32 and we have 128 K cache lines, right? So this is what I, we, we have to first figure out from the opening line, right? Now let's find out how many address bits are there. Right, so number of address bits is coming from physical memory. You have eight gigabytes of physical memory. So log eight G is 33 bits. So you have a 33 bits address space. Byte offset bits is log of block size. So all these logs are to the base two, right? So log 32 is five bits. So from this 33 bit sequence, the lower five bits are reserved for byte offset. Naturally, if you subtract the two, the 28 higher bits are reserved for the block number. And you can also verify that because your memory blocks is 256 M, then how many bits do you need to uniquely identify 256 M blocks log of 256 M, which is again, 28 bits. So it satisfies. So the 2D memory layout is designed like this. Okay, so now the real, now it becomes like exclusive to what kind of design it is. If you have a direct mapping, so here each memory block gets mapped to a unique cache line given by the index field, right? So byte offset bits 
for direct mapping happens to be the same five bits, which we calculated earlier. Number of index bits is, again, remember, index bits correspond to cache line. So if you have L cache lines, you have log L, which is 17 bits. Or you can think of it as L cache lines or L possible remainders when you do mod L, right? So 17 bits. So once you have taken the lower five bits as byte offset, the next 17 bits in the middle are your index bits. And your tag bits is just a simple subtraction. Number of block bits minus index bits. So your block bits were 28. So 28 minus 17 is 11. So for the index bits, they don't actually tell us anything, right? Because we get it from taking the mod of the block number. So for index bits, see, you cannot find index bits directly from the problem statement. For that, you have to find out number of cache lines. So number of cache lines can be directly calculated from the problem. And taking the log of L gives you number of index bits. It's the same as L remainder. So how do you know L? So calculate it from the problem and then take a log. Okay. And tag bits is just a subtraction, 11. Right. For fully associative, any memory block gets mapped to any cache line. So I think the wording here should be any. Any memory block gets mapped to any cache line. So byte offset does not change. We are still dealing with eight bytes in every cache line. So five bits. Now there is no index bits because there is no dedicated cache line for a given block. So your block bits happen to be your tag bits, right? So your tag bits are simply 33 is coming from your total address space. 33 bits. So 33 minus five is 28 bits, which is also the number of block bits, right? I hope you understand the meaning of hash when it is written in the front. It means number of index bits, number of tag bits, okay? But maybe in the exam, I would clearly mention number of rather than using hash. But at least in these examples, try to understand what this hash means, right? number of index bits is zero as there is no dedicated cache line for a memory block. Okay. Now this is a whole, uh, this is a homework. So try to solve it after the class as a practice, discuss it on the class lectures forum. Okay. Now set associative. Well, we discussed the demerits of both fully associative and direct mapping, right? Fully associative had a lot of comparators, so additional circuitry, large area and power. Direct mapping, well, high chances of cache misses depending on your memory access pattern. But the benefit is reduced circuitry compared to fully associative. So we want to come to a middle ground because these two are two extremes, right? So the middle ground is each memory block maps to any cache line within a unique set. That means set is predetermined, but within a set, it can map to any cache line. And what is a set? It's a collection of cache lines. So if you have one way set associative, that means a set will comprise only one cache line. So if you have L cache lines, how many sets do you have? L. You have L sets and all these sets are uniquely determined. So one way set associative is basically a direct map cache. And then an L associative would be the opposite. It's a fully associative. It's right in front of you, right? L way right. set associative means every set is going to have L cache lines. Now, if your total cache lines is L, so basically you only have one set with all the L cache lines. So all the memory blocks will go to this one set and within this one set, it can go to any of the L cache lines. This is 
what basically a fully associative cache anyway is. So if you configure Elway set associative, it's basically a fully associative cache. Now this one and L happen to be the extreme numbers for the set. So if you have M way set associative, where M is between one and L, then we have M cache lines in a set, right? So again, now if I have this generic form of K blocks, L cache lines, B bytes per block, but now a new information, which is M way set associative. So number of offset bits is log B to the base two, nothing changes there. Now you have to see that in direct mapping, every cache line was unique for a given block. Whereas in a set associative, every set is kind of unique for a given block. So you have to first find out how many sets are there. So how many sets are there? L divided by N. So in most purposes, this would perfectly divide, right? So L divided by M is your number of sets. Once you calculate number of sets, now that will give you an indication of how many index bits are there. If you remember, there was no index bits in fully associative because there was no uniqueness. In direct mapping, there was uniqueness. Hence, your index bits dependent on number of cache lines, log L. Here, your uniqueness is in the number of sets. So you have to first find number of sets and then take log base two of number of sets. So that's the key difference here. So that will give you the set index. Now, instead of having a line index, which was in direct mapping, you have a set index, right? And your number of tag bits is basically the usual subtraction, whatever is left off. Okay, so the tag bits cannot be directly computed. It's whatever is left after subtracting your index bits from your block bits. So if you see these number of block bits are like subdivided into tag bits and index bits for both direct map and set associated. Right. Now, example, if we have two way set associative, now two way means two cache lines per set. So if I have four cache lines given to me, number of sets is four divided by two, that means two sets. From that, I can find out number of index bits, which is I need only one bit to index a set, set zero or set one, right? And number of tag bits is four minus one, because you had 16 blocks in the memory. So log 16 to the base two is four, four minus one is three, right? So you have three, so if you see the block number is now partitioned into the four bits of block number is now partitioned into one bit for set and three remaining higher bits for tag. Right. And for a direct mapping, we had two bits of index and two bits of tag. So depending on your M way, your num your number of index bits would vary depending on your M, right? Now let's show you the mapping. The, the change in this diagram is I have made a group or a set. So set zero is holding line L zero and L one. Set one is holding line L two and L three. So now the unique mapping is in this case, this is which index? The, low, the least significant bit of the block number. So if you see the block number, all of these are four bits. Take the least significant bit. That would be set index. Now, in all these numbers, the least significant bit alternates. So the, here it's four zero, three zero one, zero zero one zero, zero zero one one. So your index, the set index is alternating. So you have alternate access patterns. So all reds go to set zero, all blues go to set one. And I, I have given you an idea how to think of it. 
sort of highlighted the least significant bit in the block. And within that set, once if there is anything available, it can be randomly mapped. So, so you can take your time to understand this. Again, the diagrams I have drawn here are not important to memorize. If you had enjoyed the phase one where you could design a circuit based on creativity, then if you want to spend time understanding this, go ahead, it's not rocket science. We have already done such kind of designs before. And if you understand this design, probably that would help you understand how these cash works if a request is issued for a address, right? So basically the idea here is you have now two comparators. Why? Because randomness is in number of cash lines. That's why you have two comparators. Whereas for a fully associative, randomness was across all the L cash lines. So you had L comparators, right? So here, you only have to do two compar comparisons because there are it's a two-way set associative. If it was a four-way set associative, then you had to do four comparisons, right? And based on that, now you have a two cross one encoder rather than four cross two and everything simplifies here, right? So this is not, again, this is not difficult. I have annotated what this does, select a byte, select a set and within a set, select that random line within a set. So that is that indirection, okay? So spend time understanding this so that you can appreciate how this, this works on a hardware level. But as long as you can understand how to compute these bits and how to partition this address space, then you should be good, okay? For the direct map, there's only one comparator, right? Yeah, there's always going okay. to be comparison because you know the exact tag entry you want to compare to. Okay, so now where was I? This example. This is another example where if you have eight cache lines, then a two-way set associative would give you four sets for eight cache lines. And if each cache line is 16 bytes, you can find out your memory address, right? So if your each cache line is 16 bytes, log 16 to the base two is four. So lower four bits are your offset. Your number of sets are four, eight divided by two. That means you need two set index bits. So this is called a set index bits. And then the remaining 10 is your tag, okay? So whatever the remaining here is, so, so you have, yeah, so suppose you have been given that you have a 16 bit memory address, then the remaining 10 bits would be tagged. So this is again, a logical view of what happens. Using a set, go to that particular set family. Within that set, take out both the tags and compare it with the requested tag. So that's why you have two comparisons happening here, right? And if you see here, if this is, suppose here the set, the top set is supposed set zero, right? Then line zero, line four, line eight are all going towards set zero. Now see the benefit on top of direct mapping. Your line zero would be mapped to set zero. Okay, if it sees, if both of those are empty, line zero can go into any one cache line in this first set zero. Suppose your next access is this line four, your block four. So this line is basically block in memory, right? block four. Now in direct mapping, that was an issue because block four, four to, to put block four in direct mapping, you had to remove block zero. But in this case, block four, yeah, it shares the same set index, but within that there is one free slot available. So block four now can get into that set zero and that and it would be occupied. But now if you talk about block eight, then that is an issue. But we have already like softened our approach from direct mapping. Direct mapping was too rigid, right? So this is like a trade-off, right? 
and within that it's a random mapping within a given set okay so this is this example uh for uh set associative right so if you have block 14 your block 14 is expressed as triple one zero right and if we have two sets as for our example that we are doing then your index bits is only one right so 14 15 and 7 would be mapped to set set 0 and set 1 1 now in this set 1 1 you have two cache lines so block 15 and 7 can fit within that same set index 1 okay so based on that try to like solve this question as a homework what happens if your blocks axis is 14 15 2 and 3 is there a cache hit or is there a cache miss so you should be able to understand based on this mapping if you can find out right so using nway set associative we are able to reclaim some of the flexibility of fully associative at a fraction of its cost in real estate that means area and power right so you're trying to do some kind of fully associative cache but then not do so many comparison checks Another question for homework is, suppose you have this byte memory byte address, which is 6195 in, given in decimal, right? So expand this 6195 into binary and assume that you have eight line cached. So there are L is equal to eight, number of cache lines is eight and you have 16 bytes per cache line. That means number of offset bits is four. So you have to be very quick, like in an exam scenario, you cannot afford to write all these detailed steps. I'm sorry, like uh, if you are going to do all these steps with all these English phrases in an exam, you won't be able to complete it. So your, your goal should be during practice to do as many mental calculations as possible. Okay, so right now I'm all doing mental calculation by reading the question, right? So as I'm reading the question, I'm trying to understand what I have to do. So when I read this question, 6195, that means I have to express it in a binary sequence. Eight cache line. So now I know L is equal to eight. 16 bytes per cache line. That means number of offset bits is four. So if I see a question revolving around what is L, what is number of bits for byte offset, I directly know the answer. Then the question is, we arrange these eight line cache in three different formats. One way cache, two way cache and four way cache. That means there are three different set associative designs. So one way cache is basically what? But what is one way cache equivalent to? Uh, eight. It is equivalent to direct mapped cache one way. Then you have two-way cache and eight, eight four-way cache. So the question is, where would this data be placed if you have these three different designs, right? So what line number or what index number will that memory address be mapped to? So how do you want to denote your answer? The question is denote, denote your answer by drawing the above cache layouts with set labels, right? So label all the set and shade the target cache area where it would be mapped to okay and then you can discuss on lectures forum so for one way cache you will have eight cache lines and line number is basically your set index it's a direct map cache for two way cache you will have four sets where every set would have two lines now where will that memory address be mapped to so shade that right for a four way cache, that means you have two sets, each set has four lines. Then where will that address be mapped to? Which set and which line number within that set? So that's what it's trying to ask you. Okay, so take time to do that as a homework. Okay, so any questions so far? So that is all related to like cache designs.
सिक्स वन नाइन फाइव क्वेश्चन फ्रॉम नेथन इज इट जस्ट मॉड एट फोर टू नो बी केयरफुल सिक्स वन नाइन फाइव इज नॉट योर ब्लॉक नंबर इट इज जस्ट अ डेसिमल इक्विवेलेंट ऑफ द एंटायर मेमरी एड्रेस नाउ इट डज नॉट टेल यू हाउ मेनी मेमरी एड्रेस बिट्स आर देर but once you write 6195 you know the higher bits are all going to be zeros right but that means when you write 6195 you can find out how many bits you need to write 6195 when you do that you can partition that sequence based on the information given here to find out what is the tag what is the index number and what is the byte offset that is what the question is indirectly asking you Six one nine five is not again. The confusion here is six one nine five is a decimal equivalent of the entire memory address. When we did mod, that mod was being done for the block number, which was the higher four bits. So basically, the question is asking you that you have this seven bit sequence here, right? Like if I have to reformulate that question with something what you have seen here, you have a seven bit sequence here. right if i give you a number called as 100 right now if i tell you if a memory address is 100 in decimal format find out where is it mapped to in this design shade that cache line or shade that shade that byte in fact now 100 is not your block number so you have to write 100 as a 7 bit sequence and then partition that 7 bit sequence based on this that's what 6195 or whatever that number is yeah yeah nathan yeah chop off the last four bits then do this modulo based on one way or like m way and then yeah it is a byte address right hopefully that is said here right memory byte address 6195 great it's good to do these mistakes right now